collective dynamics. And um, one other note, normally or usually, I do not have any text on my slides, but today I've included quite a bit of text, a lot of text, so that uh, if you don't understand what I'm saying, you might be able to read it on the slide. So, and I hope that helps. All right, so if you were to survey the literature on social evolution, just the popular literature, what you might find are some of these books. Biology of Moral Systems, which was written by Richard Alexander in the 80s, or uh, Matt Ridley's The Origins of Virtue, or uh, Franz Duval's Good Nature, Good Natured, which is about the evolution of morality, or uh, Elliot Sober and David Sloan Wilson's Unto Others, also about morality and altruism, or Sam Bowles' Microeconomics, in which he deals with economics in evolutionary terms. So you might find these books, if you were a naive reader of social evolution and you were surveying the popular literature, and you might come to the conclusion that what social evolution is about is human behavior, and the things that researchers want to explain are the evolution of cooperation, the evolution of altruism, uh, why we live in groups, how uh, social processes like, or social systems, like moral systems evolve. And those are all, that is part of social evolution. But once you start to think about the issues more deeply, and you start looking at the technical literature, or more technical literature on social evolution, you might come across these books, some of which you might know. Richard Dawkins, for example, wrote a very famous book in the late 1970s called The Selfish Gene. And of course, Robert Axelrod started the Prisoner's Dilemma cooperation modeling um, trend there with the evolution of cooperation. And, and most recently, Martin Novak has written this excellent book called Evolutionary Dynamics, which surveys um, some of the equations David discussed yesterday in evolutionary theory and how they can be applied to systems as diverse as the genetic all the way up to human language. So if you read these books or, was, or were looking at this literature, you'd realize that actually the more fundamental question in social evolution is how individuals or components, parts of systems, resolve or manage their conflict. So components or individuals that have partially overlapping interests, how they resolve their conflicts. That's, for me, what social evolution is fundamentally about. And some of the problems that students or researchers of social evolution face are identifying the conditions under which autonomous or partly autonomous and sometimes self-replicating components with only partially aligned interests coordinate, cooperate, or form aggregates. Aggregates are collectives, collectives of individuals. And another question might be, how do we determine whether there are principles that constrain the patterns and structures that we observe at the collective level? Am I going slowly enough? Or do I need to go? Yes? Too slow? Too slow? Good. All right, so once you realize that social evolution is about these more general questions, then you realize that it doesn't just apply to groups of primates, which I study, or meerkats, which are often um, used as model systems, model systems for social evolution, but of course also to social insects. So to explaining how social insects, which are, seem relatively simple compared to humans, for example, each insect, manage to build such elaborate structures as this um, foraging, ch this um, fungal harvesting cha chamber. Right. And it applies, social evolution includes questions about how fish and birds form flocks and schools, coordinate their behavior to form these incredible three-dimensional shapes that are used to evade predators. And it includes questions about how slime molds, how cells in slime molds um, decide who gets to belong to the fruiting body. That's this, we have a, does anyone have a pointer? Yeah. The fruiting bodies are these here, 
And the fruiting body, the, the um, components in the fruiting body are the components that get to replicate. So who gets to be in the fruiting body is quite an important question. This is an example. evolution includes questions about why microorganisms, as illustrated in this slide, form collectives called biofilms, or um, microbial, microbial mats. And finally, it even includes organisms such as volvox, which is a green algae, and a volvox is what's called a colonial organism. A colonial organism is one that where the individuals, the cells, can live by themselves, but can also form collectives. And that's quite unusual, that, they, that any organism can do both. And Volvox is very interesting for social evolution. It's considered a very interesting model system, because this genus has many species in it, and they form collectives of different sizes, with different numbers of cells, and with different degrees of specialization. So it's a very nice model system for asking how this, these different levels of complexity arise, and why. So, when you look at the diversity of uh, organisms that can be studied by asking questions about social evolution, you realize that this treatment emphasizing only the evolution of cooperation and why individuals form groups is actually only one part of this set of problems that we face in social evolution. So all of these books emphasize the biological basis of cooperation, they emphasize why cooperation evolves, and why and under what condition higher levels of organization become targets of selection. So the levels of selection problem, that's what that's called. And those are the canonical questions of social evolution. However, there is a much larger space of questions, some of which does get addressed. For example, books seeking to understand the origins of hierarchy in social evolution, David discussed some of these yesterday, have been very important. So Richard Dawkins, to some extent, um, started this in social evolution with the extended phenotype. David mentioned the Evolution of Individuality yesterday with Leo Buss, written by Leo Buss. Um, the Major Transitions in Evolution is perhaps the most explicit on this topic. So Maynard Smith and Sadmari, the authors of The Major Transitions, uh, asked in this book, how, why do we see repeatedly over evolutionary time transitions from simpler unicellular organisms to more complex multicellular ones? And you can extend that question to ask, why do we see transitions from individuals living in herds and flocks to full-fledged societies with roles and a division of labor and complicated means of communication? So The Major Transitions is really one of the first popular books to treat this question directly. And then um, the last book is about how um, changes in the way information is transmitted between organisms influences those transitions. D David then mentioned niche construction, this book by Mark Feldman, John Alden Smee, and Kevin Leyland. And this is, in my mind, quite an important book, a first pass at asking how do organisms construct those higher levels of organization? How do they build them? And what influence does that building process have on their fitness. So how does the building process, the construction, the, how they change the environment, then change the selection pressures they're subject to? And what this book does effectively, although it, it, what I'm about to say is nowhere really in this book, is this, this book makes clear that we need to understand not just why organisms modify their environment to change the selection pressures, but how. 
And this question actually, and again, it's nowhere in this book, what I'm about to say, it wasn't David's talk yesterday. Um, this, book, what this book effectively does is connect, the theory of niche construction connects these kinds of questions in evolutionary biology about the origins of hierarchy to questions concerning the evolution of development. And so David talked quite a bit about this yesterday. So by the evolution of development, I mean, why do we see the diversity of forms that we see in the world? So why do we have elephants and tigers and trees and seashells? Are there rules that constrain and guide the process by which those phenotypes, those forms, arise from the genotype, from the genome? And there's a whole series of, of work, uh, of books, and lots of research on the evolution of development, but it's been largely disconnected from um, questions about the origins of hierarchy and evolution. And this kind of theoretical framework begins to pull these two things together. So a little bit more background to make this clear on development. <laughs> So the study of how body a body plan arises from the genome is called development. So these are body plans. This is a sea urchin, and this is a starfish. And development asks the question, how do we go from genetics to those body plans? Okay. How do we get the radial symmetry of the starfish and the sea urchin? How do we get five legs? How do we get that um, endosperm? The covering of the starfish. Okay. And what I want to suggest is that actually, we perhaps best understand how aggregate features are generated from information at lower levels um, by studying the echinoderm. So this study of starfish and sea urchins is where the emergence or um, where, we, where we best understand the process by which these aggregate level patterns arise. Okay, not in social evolution, as it's conventionally defined. So it's, we, need, we need to look to the evolution of development for ideas about how collectives or aggregates arise from individual or component behavior. And of course, a big problem for the evolution of development is how genes are coordinated. That's, that's sort of the fundamental problem. And much of the work on echinoderms, on starfish and sea urchin, has been trying to work out how you turn genes on and off to produce different body plans. Okay? And so in that sense, we can actually include questions about development in the space of questions about social evolution, because it's fundamentally also a problem of coordination. And the next slide is going to be quite complicated, but it will give you an idea of how much we understand about <laughs> Uh, development of, of, in this case, the sea urchin, not the starfish. Um, it will give you a sense of the causal map or causal network that researchers like Eric Davidson at Caltech have been building to connect the body plan of the sea urchin with um, its genome, with okay, genetics. So this is the map. And what it is, is it's a map of, of or a network, map and network, I'm going to use synonymously. The map tells us how genes are turned on, or on and off or coordinated to produce a sea urchin. So it's a map of the gene regulatory architecture of the sea urchin. And of course, in, in these edges, these lines in the map, <coughs> have all been determined by rigorous experiment, usually knockout or perturbation experiments. And, um, what, what this gives us is, is a very deep understanding of the emergence, or the, uh, sorry, not the emergence, but the, the, how that, what the rules are governing that, the evolution of that body plan for the sea urchin. And one of the reasons why this is important, because obviously this is quite complicated, and we don't want to sort of stop with this. We want to reduce this to something simpler. And one of, one of the ways, one of the ways we can use this map is once we have it, and we have a map for the sea urchin, and we have a map for the starfish, we can compare the gene regulatory architecture of the sea urchin and the starfish to ask what is conserved during evolution. 
What are the important circuits, the, the important genetic circuits and gene regulatory architecture in both the sea urchin and the starfish? And by asking that kind of question, we can start to get at principles of development. Principles uh, that tell us how you go from lower level dynamics at the genetic level, for example, to collective or to uh, aggregates. In this case, it's phenotypes. Okay. All right, so what we have is a fairly good understanding now of how you go, how, you, how the phenotype in the case of the starfish or the sea urchin arises. But we have no map like the one I just showed you from Eric Davidson's lab for any of the other examples on this slide. We have no map yet like that Eric Davidson map. We have some crude understanding of how collectives and aggregates arise in these other examples, but they're not nearly as well studied. So what we want is to make similar maps, maybe based on different computational principles, but similar kinds of maps for these other examples. Okay. So for, for, from my perspective, the future of social evolution is about these things. We want to understand not only why organisms form aggregates, which is the focus of much of the work on social evolution, so why animals cooperate, but also under what how they form aggregates. How? What is the process by which those aggregates arise? Are there constraints or principles that guide that construction process? Because it would be great if we could do this for a single uh, examples like for a biofilm or for the sea urchin, but in the end we want principles that apply to all of these examples. So to answer this question, we need to frame the construction process, I would argue, as a computational process. And I'm not going to say a lot about this today, mainly for reasons of time and uh, complexity, but if we can describe the construction process for different kinds of organisms and aggregates computationally, so David mentioned the Chomsky hierarchy yesterday. That would be one computational framework one could use. We can then compare them. We then have a sort of um, complexity space in which we can start comparing these different examples and how they, um, how they produce these interesting aggregate features. And we can ask how these processes evolved. So that's, that's what I think is the future of social evolution, those kinds of questions. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we do that for some of the systems that my colleagues and I study. Okay. But before I do, a very important question. So what is the collective or aggregate pattern that we want to explain? So in the case of the sea urchin or starfish, it's fairly obvious because we can see them. We can see their phenotype. They're right in front of us. We can make measurements on that um, body plan. We can, we can determine how many arms the starfish has, we can make statements about um, you know, the radial symmetry of the sea urchin. Uh, and similarly, if we're interested in these kinds of collective patterns, they are also directly observable. Right? So we can make measurements on the diameter of the fish school, its trajectory, where it's moving in space, how fast it's going. These are all potentially collective features that we might want to explain by making a model of how the individual interaction patterns uh, relate to those collective features. Now, in the fish case and in the starfish case, the collective pattern is directly observable. Okay? What's the collective pattern we might want to explain here? So here we have a group of monkeys. Maybe you might say they're social network. They have a social network, they're grooming, so this is grooming. They're grooming each other. Maybe we want to explain the social network. But that might not be a very interesting, that might not be a very interesting collective feature. So one, one that we might want to explain is the power structure. So here's a fight, a typical fight in a monkey society. These are macaques. They're actually called pigtailed macaques. Macaca nemestrina. This is a captive group, obviously. And let me just show that again. 
Okay. So what you saw in that fight were two individuals attacking each other, and a third individual intervened and took the side of one of the participants. Okay. Now, these monkeys have many fights like this. Many, many fights. And during these fights, one individual usually learns from its history of fighting with its partner. So say David and I have a series of fights that it's likely to lose. So let's say David and I have a series of fights, and I learn that he can beat me up. When I learn that, and he can't, by the way. <laughs> and when I learn that, um, then what I do is I emit a signal, a special signal called a subordination signal. Subordination, that's the critical term. A subordination <laughs> signal tells, if I give David a subordination signal, it tells David that I acknowledge that he is stronger than I am, and I know he can win our conflicts. And so I will agree to the subordinate role in the relationship, temporarily, okay? Until enough information builds up and we can reverse our relationship, and then I know I can beat him up and eventually he will give me the signal. So when, when the monkeys give the signal, the monkey who gives the signal um, is the only one who gives the signal until the relationship reverses. So it's, a, it's called a unidirectional signal. So lots of um, social animals like wolves and um, chimpanzees, which are apes, have these kinds of signals. So in, in chimps, this is called a pant grunt, and this is a subordinate pant grunting to the, in this case, the alpha male. Here, uh, this is actually not a subordination signal, but a dominant signal. It's also unidirectional, serves a similar purpose. And this is the pigtail subordination signal. The, um, it's called the silent bare teeth display, SBT for short. And so the network of these signaling interactions, which is shown here for this group, so these are the edges in this network are signals going from one individual to another. And the nodes, the round circles, are individuals. This is the network of signaling interactions. And encoded in this network is information about the power structure. So this is the aggregate pattern that we want to explain, or one of them, in a monkey group. How power structures with this kind of distribution, or some other distribution, might arise. For example, these are all abnormal distributions. There are many different kinds of distributions of power that could arise given different signaling networks as input. And in the, in the second talk today, I'm going to explain all of this in detail. But I just want to give you a sense now of how, of what an aggregate pattern in a monkey society might look like. Because the critical point is that it's not directly visible. We have to infer the power structure by watching these kinds of interactions and then calculating something on this network. The monkeys have to do that also. They are probably doing it in a more simple way than we are, we are when we make our calculations, but they also have to infer the collective pattern and its implications for them. So it's quite different than the fish school or the starfish, where the collective pattern is directly observable. It's harder. It's harder in a way. Okay, so another collective pattern that you might observe in a monkey society, for example, it comes from the uh, comes from the pattern of conflict in, in, in the group. So here we have a time uh, time series of um, this is the hour. So this is noon. This is 8 p.m. So in the evening. And on the um, and the bars represent the occurrence of fights in the group. The height of the bar, how tall the bar is, tells us something about the total number of conflict participants in that fight. Okay? So you can see that the total number of conflict participants ranges from zero to, in this case, this is one day of fight data, to about, um, I don't know, what is that? Six, seven, seven or eight animals. 
And of course, many different time series of conflicts are possible. So we could, this is a representation, a simpler representation of the time series. So again, we have time, and the, the blue bars represent fights, and the space between the bars is a peaceful period. And you can have long fights followed by a short, peaceful period and a very short fight. Or you could have many fights of roughly similar size separated by short, peaceful periods. Or you could have, in, in, over the course of a day, one large fight. So there are many different variations on the time series that you might observe. And features, statistical features of the time series that you might want to um, account for include things like the distribution of fight sizes, which is represented here on this slide. That's all the long fraction is. It's simply the distribution of fight sizes. Okay? So this might be a collective feature that you want to explain. All right. So to summarize, in thinking about micro to macro um, transitions, or individual, how we move from the individual to the collective level, these are some issues that we want to keep in mind. So first, it's critical that we identify the potentially important collective patterns, so we have some hypothesis, because we don't always know ahead of time which patterns are important, some hypothesis about which collective pattern is interesting, and then we hopefully can quantitatively describe that collective pattern. Okay. Now, how do we do this? Well, the way we do it, my colleagues and I, is we extract from the data, like the time series, and I'm going to go over this in great detail in a few minutes, the strategies or the decision-making rules that individuals use during their interactions with each other. So the decision rules or strategies they use when deciding how to interact with other components or other individuals in or in response to a change in an environmental variable. And the goal, in some sense, is to build, like that Eric Davidson network that I showed you, the sea urchin network, a causal network Oops, from, from these decision rules or strategies that we pull out of the data that specifies the relationship between the individual and the collective level. Okay. And then again, as you remember, with the Eric Davidson network, that was really complex, right? We want something simpler, so we want the proper network, we want to build the right network to know that we've got the right causal rules, but then we want to compress that network to something um, that will give us a sense of what the principles are. Okay, so we want to reduce, reduce the causal network to its critical features. And finally, um, ideally, we would like to give a computational description of the process that generates that compressed network. We're not going to get to that today, but we will cover some of this. All right. So that was my review of social evolution and um, how we approach, my colleagues and I, questions in social evolution. Quite different from what you might hear from um, somebody who works on more conventional problems in social evolution, who might stress, for example, the importance of kin selection or group selection, who asks those target of selection or levels of selection questions.